part of my passion is teaching people to reduce their expenses because the truth is you don't even if you are successful like do you really need to like spend your money on rent What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, STR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I am your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's going on, E? Mr. Shogren, so good to see you, man. It's been, I don't know, we recorded last week. For some reason, it feels like the weeks are kind of flying by. Um, we are, what is now, the end of the middle of February. Uh, so the year is running, um, but life is good, man. Just same thing. I actually um, had somebody approach me yesterday to uh, join the join the brokerage, which is very interesting because I wasn't expecting somebody to come and, and ask. I was expecting that I would have to find people, but it's actually somebody that is it's local and does vacation rentals. Um, he has four or five of his own. Um, so it's just like like-minded. And, and what I was reminded of yesterday is, is how much when you're in alignment, things just kind of flow. And it's just like one of my, my, my friends and in, in, I was having a conversation. I was like, Oh, this is difficult. This is difficult. It's like, what if, what if life is easy? Like, what if, what if it's instead of like thinking about the difficulties, you're like, how can this be easy? And, and I've been kind of like, kind of thinking and sitting with that. And what I realized is like the moment I get more focus and more in alignment, life is easy. Like life just kind of flows because how did this guy come through? You know, we've had conversation in the past, but what not? Why now? You know, so very interesting yeah. to just kind of like realize, you know, that less resistance you kind of put in place. Um, life just kind of flows. But how's how's your week been? It's good, man. I'll, I'll share a little something too. So I just got back from a trip uh, yesterday. Some of the folks may have seen me taking some pictures with Bill Faith. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got some big stuff in the works, which I'm super excited. Can't announce it yet, but on the next episode, we'll definitely announce it. Uh, really excited for that. But um, I used to have really bad anxiety when I flew, and that didn't really bother me the last couple of years, but I really haven't been on a plane much. And that anxiety came on strong oh. on whatever it was a couple of days ago. Yeah. And um, I was sitting there and just trying to go back through all the personal development things. And all of a sudden, this affirmation came to me, and it it was just, I kept saying it to myself, my dreams are bigger than my fears. My dreams are bigger than my fears. And I just kept repeating it over and over again. And uh, I actually just got goosebumps when I was saying it because I was in like full blown, like terror panic attack mode, getting on that plane. Yeah. And I just kept repeating it. And then I just felt this huge peace come over me. And I just kept seeing this thing that we're working on, like come to fruition. I was like, this is absolutely worth it. Oh, that's awesome. And, um, So if you're going through that right now, whether you're doing a short-term rental deal or an investment or whatever it is, and you're freaking out, try that affirmation out. My dreams are bigger than my fears, Mm. but, um, I'm excited for, for today's episode, man. I don't even know if he remembers this, but he, he spoke at an M one thing, God, probably four or five years ago. And I remember listening to his story and I was like, man, this is an inspiring dude. Like just a super awesome, inspiring guy. And, And um, I, I've always thought about about Sam, and it's good for us to talk about it now because he's not on yet, so he's in the waiting room. We changed our our, our software, so now we're trying something else. And Sam in his waiting room, so we can give him all the compliments we want, and then he can come on afterwards. But he can interrupt us. But I always saw him as like you know he's he's our age, but just like a clear leader, right? Like he's you can tell that he spent a lot of time crafting his leadership abilities and and he's and he's a great husband and a good friend and and so really excited to have him on we've been chasing him for a little while um but i've come to learn after all this time doing the podcast that usually the more we chase somebody the better the show is going to be so i am (laughs) 
super excited to to have Sam on, but I'll let you finish the, the intro, Mike, sorry. Yeah, so without further ado, today we have Sam Wiegert on the show. And uh, he, most of you probably, if you're familiar with like martial arts, like he's killing it in the martial arts game and that's what he's passionate about. But he also owns uh, 11 short-term rentals and he's got a very cool strategy that he's using with short-term rentals that we're going to get into today. So Sam, without further ado, man, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. What's up, guys? Thanks for the intro. Um, I was able to hear those compliments. <laughs> I was in the waiting room, but I was able to hear them. I want you guys to know that. And um, I've never actually been on a podcast where before I've even spoken, I have like half a page of notes. That was good shit, guys. <laughs> I'm like, love how it. can this be easy? Dreams are bigger than my fears. I love this. This is the best podcast already. <laughs> I feel like I'm listening to it, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love That's it, awesome. man. So tell us a little bit about like up level first about yeah. like what you're passionate about. And then let's transition into how you got into the whole short-term rental space. Yeah, hundred percent. So up level is the for my first foray into entrepreneurship that I ever had. It started, and I, and I could talk about it for an hour. So I'm going to keep a real high level story. I was uh, uh, one of eight siblings, so big family. We all were allowed to pick one activity in our life, and so I picked soccer for a little bit, and then I transitioned to martial arts. And uh, it just helped me build a lot of confidence. It gave me the discipline that I think a lot of that has translated to short-term rentals. A lot of that has translated to real estate investing in general. And um, I was in this place and my instructor was burnt out from teaching. He said, Sam, I want to sell you the school. I was 15 years old at the time. I was homeschooled. So I kind of was in this like, I could do school. I didn't have to go to school. And my parents just had tremendous belief in me. And they loaned me $15,000 to buy a little martial arts school in a little town called Amherst, Virginia, right outside of Lynchburg, Central Virginia. And from there, I just wanted to be somebody and prove to the world that I could, uh, that I was enough ultimately, if I'm being really real about it. Then, so I just, um, I built a martial arts company. We now have seven brick and mortar locations. I, I opened up one in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where University of Virginia is. I then moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and uh, opened up six additional brick and mortar locations. And we now have an online program thanks to COVID uh, with students in 25 states. I'm I'm removed a decent amount from my business. My, my brother is the CEO. He runs it. He's amazing, my younger brother. Uh, but it is a business that has dramatically impacted my lives. And every single day I get to hear stories about how it has helped people with more of their uh, discipline and confidence and building physical fitness and self-defense. So something I'm very passionate about. Thanks for letting me speak about it for a moment because uh, it's uh, it's got a big place in my heart for sure. Hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. So every time I hear it, I can't believe your parents how, used to homeschool eight kids. Like I know, right? Absolutely. I've got one, man. I couldn't fathom it. We did it for I, a while with COVID, I have, and I was like, I have friends that have kids, and like I experienced them the way I'm like eight homeschool. <laughs> like that's why you had to be into martial arts, though, because with eight siblings, you need to kind of know how to protect yourself. At you home. know how to protect yourself. Yeah. The thing that the thing that honestly surprises me most about my upbringing is when my parents loaned me. Like, I guess I was just raised in the homeschooling environment and we had a bunch of homeschooling friends. So that part was just kind of normal, at least for me, looking back at it now, I am like, oh my gosh, mom, yeah. that's crazy <laughs> what you did. But the fact that they, like my parents weren't rich, but the fact that they loaned me 15 grand as a 15 year old, that part, you know, I, I could get tears about that part because I'm like, mom, like, where did you even get the 15 grand from? Like, how did you even have 15 grand to loan me to buy this martial arts? Like, it wasn't a lot of money. It's not like it's a tremendous amount of money, but for your 15 year old to go start a business, like that part just just shows how much belief my instructor had in me and i just believe that anything we accomplish in life ultimately is at some levels because someone believed in us and um you know sometimes we're borrowing the belief of the people around us but uh for mm. me it really was my parents my teachers my coaches mm. yeah so good my friends so like good. you guys yeah. another another nugget sometimes you just got to borrow the belief for a little while but that's amazing man and I'm so borrowing that statement from Hal Alrod. He's big on borrowing the belief, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Sharing it with the world. So how did all this transition into short-term rentals, right? Like how did, how did you even think about like getting in the game for that? Like what was that conversation like with yourself and your, yeah. your lady there? Yeah. Um, it, it, I fell into short-term rentals for sure. <clears throat> I, it was not something I was even doing for a business. It was not something I even wanted to, I just literally like rich people have second homes, right? <laughs> like that's what I thought. And then when they don't stay in them, they rent them out, right? Like that's like, I just wanted to be, I just thought, you know what? I can get a good loan. And I love this little cabin I found in a town called Black Mountain. It's right outside of Asheville, North Carolina, which my wife has, my wife, Rachel has lived there for eight years. 
And she, that's, we met in that town. We have so many like fond memories. So to me, it just seemed like the right thing to do to have a place to go to vacation. And it was turnkey. And what's funny is like, I didn't realize up until this point, I'd never fully furnished a house. And even up until like a year ago, I had never fully furnished a house. Cause even with our long-term rentals, we just furnished the common spaces. So we've just recently done a full furnishing of a house. And I was like, wow, I guess I have bought a lot of turnkey short-term rentals because this is a pain in the butt. <laughs> like to fully fur- um, So I, long story short, Michael, we, I, I wanted to live in a place. I wanted to go visit a place. I wanted to have a place to vacation and hang out with friends. And so that was how we bought the first place. And then from there, yeah, the cash flow was really good. That was probably back in 2016. Don't quote me on that year, but I want to say 2015, 2016. And I just had so much fun and the income started to be really good for it. And I thought, you know what, I'll just get another one. But it was, wasn't really a focus, I would say, until maybe a year ago. And then I started thinking like, okay, uh, I'd like to buy some more of these. <laughs> mm. So what does mm. your system look like? So it's you and Rachel, right? Yeah. And so like, what, what do you guys do? Like, do you spend time actively on it or, or one of you spends more time on it? Like, what, what does that look like? Because I mean, 11, 11 short-term rentals is not a small undertaking you know yeah and they're all several hours i live in charlotte north carolina and most of them with the exception of two are in Asheville, so they're two hours away from from where we live so it's so it's even more difficult for that reason um yeah so it's really evolved for us so my focus has been on the long-term rentals and so i built out a property management team to handle those and it just kind of naturally flowed for us to start giving them different responsibilities over the the, the short-term rentals as well. So, hey, my property manager, he's the one who responds to all the messages. We've got a badass handyman guy in Asheville um, that, that, that is able to take like the emergency after hours calls if there is something like that. Um, Rachel is for sure like head designer, <clears throat> worked a lot on putting together the automated messages. She writes the listings for these things. She's just got a real – aesthetics is her number one like value driver in life. So things looking beautiful, furnished, like that is her. And so she handles like basically everything from, hey, baby, I bought a house. Here's a house. It's It has some furniture. It has all the furniture. It has no furniture. And she'll go in. She'll put her beautiful stamp on everything. And she's got her little handyman contact that will, you know, change the locks and do all of that. And then at that point, she'll write the listing. Um, and then she works with the property manager to schedule photos and to, um, to get this thing, to get it live. I'm not sure if that 100% answered your question, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the breakdown of responsibilities. I like, I'm looking for properties. I'm negotiating for them. I'm buying them. Rachel, my wife is like putting her stamp of approval on it, furnishing them. And then the property management team that we already have in place is responding to messages, inquiries, handling bookings once they're there. And then our, our maintenance guy is like the after hours contact. And, and so and how do you, you guys have like a third party cleaning company as well that does all the turnovers? It's not, um, yes, it's not, a, it's just honestly the cleaning lady and Apple that we have, we found on Facebook. Like I put a Facebook, I remember, okay. So we had a cleaner, she was good, but not great. And everybody kept telling me like, Hey, the best thing you could do for short-term rentals is literally hire the best cleaner. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But then like some, and I, like, I didn't believe them until little things started to happen. It was just like, she, and, and I wasn't managing the cleaner, but I still like, it would seep to me. And I'd be like, why is this coming to me? Like the cleaner is pissed off at this. And you know, it's like, there's dog hair at the place. Like, yes, we pay you to clean the place. Like, don't tell us that you're mad that there's dog hair. Like, that's what we pay. Like, it was just like things like that that just started to get annoying. And so I was like, I'm putting an ad out. So I put an ad out on like some local Facebook, like Asheville jobs, like a Facebook group. But then I just put a normal ad out on like a Facebook. I think it's Facebook marketplace. You can post jobs to Facebook marketplace. Mm-hmm. And this lady from, I think from Mexico was like, I was a lawyer in Mexico. I'm trying to restart my life. And she's like her and her mom and her husband are like the best team we've ever had. You never hear anything. And it's all five-star reviews about cleaning. So um, hopefully that little story was helpful, but yeah, easy to, she was great to find. And she's the one that handles all of that. Yeah. I wanted to highlight that it wasn't like Rachel or you or anybody else that was like doing the cleanings. It was like, no, we went out and found good people that could clean the properties for us. Basically. No. And, and the for other sure. thing that, it, that it's funny to like realize what Sam said, it's, it, it somehow got to me. 
Yeah. <laughs> right? So what that means though is it's like as a business owner, right? And like from 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 like having all that like oh, karate studios and stuff, you know, you create a system and you know that there is supposed to be some people in the way to something getting to you. And things get to you that are just of utmost importance. Right. And so things are getting to you that are not of the utmost importance. So Sam is like, something is wrong. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong, but something is wrong. Right. But again, that goes to understanding like, what is your role in your business? If you're the architect of the business, which is what Sam is, right? I just architect this and create the systems underneath me. Yes. That's when you realize you're like, why am I dealing with this? Yeah. There is a breakdown somewhere. But that yeah. again goes to understanding like how to leverage yourself. Because again, like Mike said, Sam or Rachel having no point being like, we're going to go clean because we can do it better than this lady. Because that's just a waste <laughs> of time, right? Like there's no value. You know? Being two hours away, Emmanuel helps with that because it's like, <laughs> you know, something would happen with the cleaning. It's like we would tell our property manager like, you need to have a backup. Like that's yeah. your that's your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. We can't drive to go clean. Good luck. And that's just one other th quick thing that I wanted to highlight too, because yeah. a lot of people they'll reach out to me or Ian, they'll be like, you know, I found this great place, but it's like three hours away from where I lived. Like, mm. shouldn't I do my first one in my backyard? First one I did was three and a half hours away. Wow. If anything, it feels scarier, but it forces you to to create that infrastructure, like we were yeah. just talking about. So like. It's too easy when it's close to go, you know, change the batteries That's or right. fix this or fix that or clean it if something happens. If it's further away, it forces you to have, like you said, the cleaner and then a backup. Like what happens yeah. if that, what if they get sick? What if they get COVID? Like whatever, like what yeah. is your plan B? And think all that stuff through as a business owner out the gate. Totally. And I and think, so, my, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, so now, I mean, you went from one to two. Now, I think you said you're up to 11 properties. Has that evolved over time? And what does that look like for you now, I guess, compared to at the beginning when you just had the first couple? I, I, that's exactly where my brain went. As you were saying all that, I, my brain kind of went off on this little tangent. I'll see if I can track it uh, and explain it. So <clears throat> I was thinking back to when I only had two or three properties total, maybe one short-term rental and one or two long-term rentals. Like cash flow in that business was tight. And I remember like, I remember having to replace an HVAC at one of my long-term rentals. It wasn't even a short-term rental, but I was like, shit, like this thing's like no money. Grand. Yeah. No but, money for the next eight months. And I had, yeah. So I remember <laughs> take exactly. So I remember taking money from my, uh, from my martial arts business and like mm -hmm. loaning it to the real estate company to pay for the, and I remember being like, man, this isn't cool. And so I, we definitely did a lot more. I would say, uh, I did a lot more personally at one two, three, I would say up to eight or nine homes. It was not uncommon for me to go to a home, uh, handle something, Rachel to handle something, Rachel, maybe to do even a cleaning at that point. But I, I was trying to think of the number as you were talking, Michael, I think it was close to like nine to 10 homes where I remember, and I distinctly remember this, like I distinctly remember having like an exhale. Cause I would look at the account. I'd be like, okay, there's like 45,000 in that account. I've been okay. Like I could have four HVACs go out and I wouldn't have to like borrow money from this, but it did take a little feeding for a little bit as I kind of, and here's the other thing too, in long-term and short-term rentals, I got better at evaluating deals. So my margins mm -hmm. started to grow. Like I remember the first deal I evaluated, I didn't even put like an ongoing maintenance charge in it. I didn't put any property management charge. I was just like, okay, this is what I'm getting rent. And well, that's what my mortgage is. I should make money. Right. And so I, I think that's another key point. And I've been doing a real estate training this whole week and something I've been trying to hammer home. Like, guys, this is not an emotional decision. You need to have a great process for underwriting deals and you need to cushion it enough for life to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think between those two factors, so between like just kind of some volume and then me evaluating deals better, I do specifically remember like that. There was a point in this real estate journey for me where I was just like, ah, okay, let's hire that person. No, Rachel, don't clean. No, 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 not anymore. You know, and that, whole process kind of started to, to move in that direction. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe that should happen. Maybe that should have happened earlier. Like maybe that should have happened on house one or two, but there wasn't a ton of cash there, right. To handle that. Unless I kept kind of feeding it somehow. No. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think you brought up a great point, Sam, because I think a lot of people, I mean, I used to do like maintenance and, and everything as well. Right. And right, it's understanding right. of like, 
one is the natural evolution of your of your brain. Also, because I think we've been taught that for you to do something, you got to be actually doing it for a mm. certain amount yeah. of time, right? So it's very yeah. difficult for you to just go into something and not have that, like, I need to be, like, in the business to work on it instead of just working from the top. Um, but then again, like real estate, especially long-term real estate, that's a, that's a big reality that people don't understand. It's like, it's a couple hundred bucks a month and it's, and it's the slow game. And when yeah. you buy cheap houses, the biggest problem with buying cheap houses is you get cheap rent. And the point of cheap houses is that the f fixing of things is not in relation to how cheap the rent is. And what I mean by that is that yeah, if you go to yeah. Lowe's and you're buying, your rent is 450 bucks and a dishwasher goes out, Lowe's doesn't be right. doesn't look at your rent. It's like, oh, you only make 450 a month. Oh, we're so sorry. We'll reduce the price of <laughs> 100 bucks to be in in comparison to it's is the same. Right. So now that great rent doesn't doesn't cover it, and that's why at that small rent you want to go for a larger number of units so you have economy of scale. Yeah. And then something happens, something happens, but you have enough units. But right. again, dude, real estate is slow, and that's why short-term rentals it's it's a hack in a sense because the cash flow allows for issues a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, dude, that's a beautiful, beautiful point. Uh, and and I love the analogy of like, hey, um, your your washer is still going to cost four fifty. It's still going to cost. Uh, it's a month of rent. Yeah, <laughs> but 100%. it might be like we have a home right down the street from where I'm sitting right now. We rent for fifty two fifty a month. Like, great. Washer goes out. That's literally less than ten percent of the of what you rent the home for. Like, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Beautiful point. I want to so, I want to pivot to to. The, what we were talking about off air of this, this co-living, right? This niche that you've kind of carved out. Can you explain to the listeners, like, what is this co-living niche and how does it intertwine with short-term rentals? Yeah. To quote David Green from Bigger Pockets, when I was doing the episode with him, he says, Sam, co-living sounds like long-term rentals and short-term rentals got together, had a baby and, and co-living was born. Which is just we laughed and it was a funny comment, but I'm not sure that's exactly how I would describe it. But that it's a it's a it's a little bit of a mix of a lot of these different things. Co living in essence is simply taking a single family home, furnishing common areas. So maybe that's the little piece that like feels like a short term rental because you're you're furnishing a piece of the home, and renting out the bedrooms, and then also converting maybe a dining room or a living room into an additional bedroom. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people in the co-living niche that are furnishing everything, like even the bedrooms. My team doesn't do that because I, I want them to feel like this bedroom is their apartment. It's their new apartment, you know, and I'm not going to furnish. Like you make it your own uh, and they're going to sign a 12 month lease on it. So, so we do, we do, we just let go of all month by month leases because it was creating too much turnover. So we do six month and 12 month leases. So technically in that sense, it's, it's a long-term play. Now, because you could have four, five, six, seven, eight, my biggest homes have nine tenants in one house, you're going to, um, shoot, I forgot where I was going with that. Anyway, you could you have make, that many. You, you make you make vacation rental money almost. You make almost short-term money because you have nine people renting. So you're probably yeah. charging them how, like, let's say a long-term rental there will be how much? So a long for a twelve month lease for a master bedroom would be eight fifty, and a shared bath is going to be seven fifty for to use round numbers. It could vary if the room is really small or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, you're took you're taking a home on that particular home. You know, you're taking a home that maybe would rent for twenty three hundred, maybe you know, and you're getting sixty three hundred a month for it. It's longer term. There are lots of nuances to it, um, which is. Uh, what people are interested in finding out <laughs> what are yeah. all the nuances yeah because my my mind is spinning right now because i'm like okay one is like how do you mix and match kind of personalities yeah. right because that would be one of my fears i'm like i don't want to like have to become a therapist about like can this. i can i pause for a second there though yeah ironically that is probably the biggest thing that people initially say they're yeah, like can, there's I no way i could have that many people find out also ironically in me doing co-living spaces for 13 plus years, I have only ever had to like kick out a tenant for that type of disagreements three times. 
Yeah. Maybe four. Like, it's yeah. just so weird to me that it doesn't like, I get that that would be a concern. You're like, how does this work? And I think the reason we've done been able to do a good job with it, Emmanuel, is because we do a pretty dang good job at the vetting process. And like just how we how we share them our how we share our house rules and how we introduce them to the community, all the other people that are in the community. I mean, it's really the whole goal is like it's community living. Um, but anyway, I didn't mean to take that off on a tangent. No, I and I and it's funny because again, like what are one of the things that happens with with vacation rentals? I feel like that is the same questions that people ask Mike and I with like, well, what about parties, right? And it's like the idea, the first thing that you think for your own kind of like personality and fears, because that would be my thing, right? Like I would hate to have a shitty roommate, like excuse right. my friends, but like, you know what right. I mean? Like that would be my concern. And that's the main concern. And again, the same thing that we tell people about parties, like in 12 years of doing this, right? how many parties did I have? Couple. Very few, you know what I mean? <laughs> and like how many people did actually wreck the property? Very few. But again, like, in looking at opportunities, unfortunately, your subconscious mind is the first thing that mm. speaks, and the subconscious mind only knows that's different. Wow. Fear. I'm gonna protect wow. myself and like my stuff. And then, wow. but a lot of the times, like again, right? If you don't ask the questions or if you don't have that awareness of it, your subconscious is gonna be like different, danger, wow. wrong, problem, not doing this. Thank you. Next thing. And you go back to the same stuff that you always do. And you're like, why? Because you have no awareness about why you're not wanting to do what you want to do. So very so well said. I just wrote that down. It's so true. Like new idea, you know, immediately guard goes up. W w how could this hurt me? How could this kill me? How could this take me down? Right? Like just a protection mechanism. It's so true. I, I, that, that analogy fits. I'm so glad you mentioned the parties because that's literally what I feel when people say, well, roommates don't get along. And you're saying about the parties, very great analogy. Um, and I wanted to say something else about that, but I, I forgot what it was. But yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah. So have you have you switched over like the whole portfolio to the co-living or do you still do some like traditional STR stuff? Like how does that look like now in your portfolio? So, so when you, so... Okay, I'll just explain how my mind thinks about this. So my when I'm going to look for a co-living space, I'm looking for 2,500 plus square feet. I'm looking for a lot of great parking, no HOA, lots of rooms that could be split up into bedrooms. Um, I'm looking for kind of a weird funky layout is perfect. You know, I'm looking for finished basements. I'm looking for a nice little common area. I'm looking for like a home that has at least three full baths because that means I only... I sometimes I'll add baths based on the ratio that I want to have of baths to bedrooms. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking for all of those things that does not fit my short-term rental criteria at all. So it's, it's a very, I've never converted. Uh, let me make sure I'm not lying. Have I converted? I've never converted a co-living to a short-term rental and I've never converted a short-term rental to a co-living. I've always just looked for completely different things. So when I go look for a short-term rental, I'm looking for at least in the Asheville area, great view, some sort of X factor. Um, the, the first house I bought a great example of this was this guy built this cabin. I say cabin. It's a, it's a nice home. Like it, it pops. Uh, but he built it around this 150 year old fireplace that had just been sitting there and he built it right next to this stream. So we have a little plaque that tells the story, uh, of this 150. It's just like a little act, like something like that. And there's this tile work that's really unique. And it's just, a, it's in this little unique area. And it's got a little basketball court. It's like several little X factors that someone would look at and be like, wow, I'm not, not every home has a basketball court. Like that's badass. Let's do that. So uh, those are the things I look for in short-term rentals or a view, a long range view. Uh, there's a lot of those in and around Asheville. Co-living is going to be more just this kind of big spread out house uh, that you can chop up into bedrooms. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just being real. That's what you do with a co-living house. Are you looking for on the co-living side? I guess like, you know, we talk a lot about like your guest avatar, like, yeah, are there certain, like, are you looking for places near like hospitals for like traveling nurses or like, are there certain demographics that you look to serve and then base like the market around that? Or have you found like a sweet spot yet, I guess, for what that looks like? I, I want to answer that question, but I just thought of something. I, that that really is a beautiful marriage of this. I have a friend. He just bought a home in Winston Salem, uh, North Carolina. He's been watching me do co living and short term rentals. So he legitimately combined them. He took a six bedroom house, turned it into an eight bedroom house, 
furnished it all and is renting out each room on Airbnb at a mm. nightly rate of like 30, 40 bucks. But he did the math for me. And if he's even booked, like it, the cash flow is still insane. It's just going to obviously he's going to have that more turnover. So that that is probably the best like marriage of these two concepts I've ever seen. I'll be curious to see how he does. But I, I know there are people out there that do that. I don't personally do that. But that's that's maybe even a, a more beautiful marriage. Um, so I was, I've been doing co-living specifically in Charlotte, North Carolina and Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville is a town of probably 50,000 people. It's really a tourist town is really what it is. It's a retirement and tourist town. And I had, I did not think it would work there. It works beautifully. So here's, and then I had a bigger pockets episode go live, literally thousands. And that's not an exaggeration. Thousands of people reached out to me and started telling me stories. I'm doing this in Denver. I'm doing this in my small town, but boom, 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 boom. So we created the Facebook page called the co-living investors community. All these people are telling me stories about where they're doing this. What's interesting is this housing is an issue everywhere, everywhere. Like it's not, it's an issue everywhere. And this is solving a big need. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have. Any requirements that I would have given you, like this is for college students. No, 100% of our tenants, I, I don't even think we have one college student in 150 rooms that we rent. It's it's young, working professionals. They've got jobs. They have to show income verification. We're renting it like an apartment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, and it's the reality of living in America, right? And I think like that is that is the most beautiful thing about this country is all the opportunities, but also mm. like this country is also very brutal when it comes to like, you need to make a living, you need to make money to survive. And you have the highest quality of living if you make money. <laughs> and it's, things can get rough if you don't have money. And the reality is like, for example, Miami was just announced the most expensive city in America, right? The least affordable right. city in America. What's going to happen to these people, right? Like what's going to happen to all the labor force, all like, especially down here, right? You have a lot of like hospitality, like yes. workers, restaurant workers, where yeah. are these people going to live? And the reality is that unfortunately, and fortunately, unfortunately, this is the reality of the country we live in. And this is a way that you can kind of provide a service in a sense, because you provide clean, safe places that are well, well yep. furnished and well run. Yep. And people, you know, because people like age 50 for a, for a master bedroom, including it's utilities. Great. It's great because like I, a one bedroom great. for me now down here, which I used to rent for like 1450, two or three years ago, I can rent that for like 2100 now. And that's a one bedroom, right? So if you're, if you're anybody, even if you're like making money, but you have maybe school loans or some right. type of other loans or medical or anything like that, right. you're getting a divorce. Like, where are you going to go live? That's right. You know, if you're a single person is getting a divorce, what are you going to do? Pay right. $2,100 plus first lesson security? Plus utilities. That's rough. You're, you're 2500 bucks a month. You're providing, you're providing a service. And and if you do it well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And you make money, which is great. Yeah. So the cash flow is, which is why it's gaining a lot of popularity now. A, there's a ton of demand. B, the cash flow is really good. If you can handle some of the nuances of it, you could do a, you can do a really great job with it. Yeah. So what I've been saying to people, Michael, to go back to your original question is like, wherever there's an issue of housing, th then, then I believe, and I, obviously I haven't tested it in every market, but I'm hearing stories from all over. This is an amazing solution to that. Mm -hmm. If you vet correctly, if you provide the right service, as you were saying, Emmanuel, like absolutely. And we've just found at least in Charlotte and in Asheville, the demand has been off the charts as housing prices have increased, as apartment rent has gone up, it's become more and more and more yeah. in demand. And people and are staying I, for years. I honestly don't see don't see a place where it wouldn't work. And the other thing that I'm thinking, which is very interesting, and I don't know how much of your your upbringing plays plays into this, <laughs> but it's just like the community feeling, right? And even how you refer to them, you're like, we show them, like, we would welcome in, into the community. So in yeah. a sense, it could become a lot of fun. Like it could be like a living kind of almost like going back to college, right? Like you have a bunch of roommates, but it's different. And you're like in a place that people do feel lonely at time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the reality, of, again, just the, the metaverse <laughs> reality that yeah. we're going towards, people are going to feel lonely. And like, dude, yeah. if you can get out of your metaverse thing and you go into your living room and there is like eight other roommates, you'll be like, oh shit, like life is real. Like there is real, <laughs> <laughs> there's real people I can hang out with. And it's not just my Oculus like reality, right? Right. So it's super interesting.
Yeah, Emmanuel, I, I, I official, I lived in these properties for 12 out of, right out of, right after I bought my martial arts school, this was how I lived until I got married. I would buy a house, rent out rooms, and then I would like fill it all up and have fun with the, and we, it was, and it was an amazing time. I officiated my first wedding I ever officiated was my roommate coming to me and be like, <laughs> and he met his wife at a little community party that we threw together. Oh, that's so awesome. Like literally if it wasn't for us, like, cause we would throw community events. So he, yeah. and then he just thought it was so appropriate that I would officiate to so that. I mean, people from Mexico, part of my passion is teaching people to reduce their expenses because the truth is you don't, even yeah. if you are successful, like, do you really need to like spend your money on rent? Like, is that really the best place for it? I, I'm, I like the fire movement, you know, financial independence and retire early. Like a big piece of that movement is get your expenses down. So this whole like American dream of let's live in a big house and yeah, it's, I, I see it shifting for, for our generation a little mm -hmm. bit and I'm excited about it. It's cool. Yeah. It's like even the house I'm sitting in right now, I'm, I'm sitting in a big house. I'm overlooking the lake. It's 4,500 square feet, but my wife and I short-term rent it when we're not here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, we house hack even our main house when we're like traveling or whatever. And it, and it, it pays for itself, you know, and that's really cool. So just that whole idea of living in community, sharing what you have, the shared economy, I feel like is becoming more prevalent. It's a, it's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways. And co-living is just a big like movement, I think, in that direction. Yeah, I see. This will be my prediction, just throwing it out there, that the, the co-living will have niches within the niche. So like there will be my prediction mm -hmm some higher end co-living places as well, like super hip trendy places that rents seem ridiculous to a lot of people, but the vibe at those places is off the charts. So mm -hmm. like the 20 something year old salesperson that's making decent money that just wants to live in a sick place with cool people. Like I could totally see that working as well in some like urban and suburban markets where it's just like, this house is sick or like an entrepreneurial type of yeah. like combinator house, right? Like yeah. I could absolutely you, see that working. And you have yeah. those a lot, like those have just been happening like low key. Like, I mean that like, you know, New York, the artist community, those, those people have been living in communal environment for always, yes. you know? And, yes. and again, like it's the reality of human. So, so, and again, I feel like this, this, the show is getting a little bit more like, philosophical but like is the reality of like the east and the west right and like the west there is a guy called oh, philip shepherd and he wrote a beautiful book called radical wholeness and there's this mm. whole idea of like the west has this need to isolate the the ego and the ego needs to live in the big castle on the hill with the white right. fence right and the west is completely different but at the same time the the ego you need people and there's no, there is no way to live life. So again, if you can do it and, and the beauty with the co-living thing and the Airbnb thing is you can be the guy that wants it for the freedom. So you're like, I don't want bills. I don't want a fixed place. I just want right. to be free. Right. Or you can do the entrepreneur that's kind of like in the mix, like Sam, right? Like you love the money, but you also love the community and taking care yeah. of people. Yes. And so there is no right or wrong, but there's just so many different ways to do it. And again, People need people at the end yes. of the day, you know? Yes. I, I have two thoughts that came up for me. I'll, two quick stories. So when uh, when people started reaching out to me to tell me that they were doing this, uh, Michael, I had someone reach out to me from Hawaii and he leased, I think he put like a hundred year lease on an entire floor of a skyscraper. He rehabbed the whole thing into 24 bedrooms with a beautiful common space overlooking the ocean. It's in like whatever the main island there is in Hawaii in one of the big cities. And he rents it for $2,000 a month. And he has a massive waiting list. And he said, I, my, his goal, the reason he reached out was he was like, look, I want to start doing this in all the major markets where people can float. And it's exactly what you just said. It's people who are just, I can work from home wow, let me go meet people. And he all, you know, and he tells me all these stories about how people are getting together. They're going on trips together after they meet in this co-living space. So it's so beautiful. Yeah. And then on the other side, kind of what you were saying, Emmanuel, I had a guy from Germany, which is not exactly the East, but I think that Europe has adopted maybe a little bit, mix, you know, yeah. starting to mix. And he said, he's building co-living 
like ground up developments, 150 doors at a time, but built for co-living. So it's basically imagine like a four bedroom apartment with a small community space. And he built it really smart. He, he, sent, he showed me the renderings. He said, if I just take out these two walls, it becomes a three bedroom apartment with a living room and then the kitchen. And I was like, dude, this is crazy. He's like, yes, I'm looking to do this. In, I want to do this more in Australia. I want to do this more in the United States. And it just, I don't know, kind of really just got me thinking and gave me faith that like, as a species, we're, we're moving together. We're, we're okay with some of these things that maybe we weren't okay with before. Yeah. hundred percent. One of the coolest things about college, honestly, is living with people and like meeting <laughs> friends, right? Like, honestly, like, awesome. do the and best. Uh, this is just like, uh, the next evolution of that. And I would absolutely, I mean, if I look at a lot of my friends, like after school, like I moved home and just try to save as much cash as I could for a property. But a lot of my friends just moved into these apartments and just got roommates. You're just fostering that for somebody like myself, who's more of an introvert of like, right. Hey man, come live in this cool space. There's going to be other people there, but like, here you go. Here's awesome, affordable housing and you'll meet some cool people here. So I love it. Yeah. I'll have to report back to you on how my friend does short term renting their rooms. I'm sure you I have it. some students that do it well. I've personally never done it. I've always yeah. done the whole house yeah. or like two, you know, if it's a fourplex, you know, two units at a time or whatever, but I've right. never done it by the bedroom. Um, I think that is a different guest avatar than somebody else, right? right? It's, it's definitely different, but I'm curious for you, Sam. So like you've, you've got a taste of a bunch of these different niches now. Where, where do you see your portfolio going in the future, I guess, for the next 12 to 24 months? Like, what are you looking for now? I got it. I, I can answer that so, so succinctly and with a ton of clarity because I have spent a lot of time in 2022 kind of after uh, my martial arts schools took an, an enormous hit through COVID. We were shut down completely for six months and it just really gave me, and then there was like kind of like nothing to do because even, even though like we skirted some of the rules, like people don't want to come in. It's close contact, touching someone like, no, I'm not going to do martial arts. So it gave me the time to really pause and think about basically the answer to your question is what I'm saying. And so now my brother has been building the martial arts back up and I, I like where I'm at with that. I, I'm going to dedicate more of my time to real estate 2022 and beyond. I I see the niche, at least in my area being luxury. And, and when I say luxury, I mean, million dollar plus homes that are, that are large, that sleep a lot and just have a lot of those little X factors that I talk about. And part of this is maybe somewhat personal because my wife loves the luxury five-star five experience. Like that's just her thing. She geeks out about it. Everything she does is like, so I'm just like, cool. I'm kind of playing to her strengths. Um, I'm playing to some of these bigger houses. The last one we bought in Asheville was like 4,041 square feet. It's seven bedrooms. It's 12 minutes from the Biltmore right outside of city limits. So it evades the short-term restriction rules. You know, it's like for, I think it's just, we haven't, it, it's going live this week, but like, I think it's going to absolutely crush it. Um, and then we placed, I actually placed an offer on one today, big view, 3,800 square feet, $1.1 million. Like I just see a lot of benefit being in that. I see it less competitive. And when you, when you start looking into like the luxury homes, a lot of them are in HOAs. A lot of them have more restrictions. So it's already a little, like it's actually harder to find like a non HOA, big home, super nice, like that's, that's a very tight niche, at least uh, outside of city limits, you know, at least in Nashville. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see the short-term rental going. And then my, I, I, I will continue to buy co-living. I love what it does. And I, and I, I would like to even build some from the ground up. Uh, that is a bigger project that, that I'm learning that it's not just like, Hey, you tell a contractor to go build you a thing. Like it's a big thing. Uh, and I'm learning that. So that could take a few years to really get underway. Uh, and then I've started, I'm coaching, I'm training a lot of people. I've been training. We have 200 people registered for our training this week. And it's just been a, like, I love, and I've loved it. I've had so much fun just like sharing everything I know about co-living and people are really excited about taking it to their markets and doing it. So, um, that was a little bigger answer than maybe you were looking for. That's kind of more my life plan for the next five years, but hopefully that also answers your question. No, no and, uh, because I want to, I just want to show people too, that, I look at short-term rentals from the beginning. It was a vehicle to get more control over my time. I was stuck in a job 
making good money, but I was trading time for dollars and I couldn't be there when my family needed me, like when my son was sick and everything else, because I ran out of vacation time. Right. And I vowed I wouldn't put my family in that situation. It is a vehicle that can get you that freedom to then pursue. You can keep growing it or you can pursue other things that you're passionate about. And like for right. you, you've always been passionate about teaching. Now you have another vehicle that you can teach yes. and then you reinvest that back into more properties and they just co coexist. They co live together. Right. Ironically. <laughs> right. But it's just, if you can help, like you said, take that fire approach of take the money piece off the table, get yourself stable. It just gives you more breathing room to think about what you actually want to do. Yeah. And for me, short-term rentals was one of the vehicles that could get me to that point faster than any that I had come across before. So we just went all in and just focused on it. Yeah. I asked a question, Michael. I think this would be good for your listeners too. I asked a question at the beginning of my living training. I said, what is holding you guys back from, from buying more real estate? And I was so surprised at the vulnerable answers of people just being like scared, fearful. What if it doesn't work out? And so just this idea of like having this group, what you guys are doing is so amazing. Just giving, giving people what I find people need a lot of. And frankly, if I'm totally honest, sometimes I need a lot of it. It's just reassurance, like just reassurance. Like you're on the right track. You can place that offer on that home. You can do that. And I just feel like that's what you guys are doing is telling, look, this works. Um, it was just amazing. I don't know. Somehow my brain connected what you said with all of that. I'm just like, that's, that's so appreciative for what you guys are doing here. And, um, I've realized that people need that in the co-living space. And I'm sure it's the same in the short-term rental space of like, hey, this works. You can do it. Uh, you'll make some mistakes on the way, but uh, take that action, right? Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. Well, and I, I love Sam. I think it also like you are you're a um, living example of like kind of like what, what Eddie was talking about. Just like, what if it's easy, right? And you just kind of take that approach to it. That you're like, it'll take me a little while to learn it. And it's, that's good, right? Like there is just this, this like, kind of like, it's, it's very chill energy that you have, but I also know you're very uh, purposeful with what you do. And there is no, it's not a, if it's a when, and you just have to have that kind of confidence. And again, like, like you said, as long as you keep putting the reps in sooner or later, you'll get there. Right. And it's just a matter of like surrounding yourself with the right people, surrounding yourself with a lot of proof of concept, because obviously that makes a big difference. Right. Yeah. And that I think that's what's so great about about the community that we have. I met somebody this week and I was like, yeah, we have a whole community. And like as soon as he found it, he joined and he's like, I've been looking for this. That's and I'm right. like, yeah, I mean, that's why we started it. Right. Like it's just like it makes it makes sense. It makes a difference, you know. But again, like don't sweat it. It's just going to the gym and like, just do the right things day in and day out, pull out white pebbles instead of black pebbles. And eventually if your pocket is full of white pebbles, you you're, you're going somewhere. Right. So I really appreciated that. Like, I really appreciate the whole podcast. It's just been like this overall energy that, that, that you have. And it just, you keep, you keep doing things and you're just kind of like very kind of flow with water. Right. What's trying to find a martial arts kind of saying that goes well yeah. here. <laughs> martial, <laughs> martial arts in a man. Right. I'm like, I don't know, like flow with water. I'm thinking about like oh, Kung Fu Panda. I'm like, I don't know any like <laughs> any <laughs> philosophical quotes from that movie. So I'm like, I don't know. Emmanuel, I, I appreciate that. I know you mentioned earlier on in this podcast, like, Hey, this is kind of going in a philosophical direction, but I, I actually really appreciate, you know, I appreciate everything you've shared even today, I've taken a few notes myself on just some, some of the philosophical stuff because so much of it is the 80, 20 rule of like, it's 80%, it's 80% mindset and psychology, you know, and 20% of it is the how 20% of it is that, but, but the rest is getting the, getting from here up, you know, from the neck up, uh, correct and right and, and screwed on. Right. So I, I think there's so much value in that when it comes to real estate investing, because some of your, even like full circle, bringing full circle. First thing you said, right. Co-living. Roommates won't get along. Fear. Short-term rentals. What about parties? Fear. Okay. Let's lean into those and, and move on so we can take action and and uh, and reach our goals. Mm. Because well, our dreams I, I, really are bigger than our fears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. 100%. So I want to be respectful of your time. I, I just realized we're, we've been on here for almost an hour. I could do another hour easily with you. So I appreciate yeah. you coming on. But um I want to acknowledge you again and thank you for coming on here and, and just being so willing to share. And like he said, your energy is amazing. Like your energy, your leadership, and just your authenticity 
just comes through. Like it's just transparent and we truly appreciate that. And I know the listeners are going to appreciate that. And so before we get into the last question, where can folks learn more about you up level, the co-living stuff that you're doing, where can they get in touch with you on all that good stuff? Yeah. F- Facebook is best. Uh, I still use Facebook. Um, I'm a young guy, but I still use Facebook. Uh, I, I, Instagram too at Sam Wiegert or Facebook, Sam Wiegert. I'm like the only one on Facebook that's named Sam Wiegert. So that is a cool, cool little hack. Um, we created a Facebook group called the Co-Living Investor Community, I think. Is, yeah, Co-Living Investor Community. So people can find us there and I'm answering questions and interacting there. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Awesome. And so the last question that we ask all of our guests is what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals? Wow. The number one secret to success with short-term rentals. And it can only be one thing. It has to be one thing. <laughs> if you got two, we'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. Uh, well, I was going to say, I, I was going to say my wife because my wife just keeps <laughs> out about the experience. And when people are on vacation, they want the experience. And so five-star experience, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. We made lots of mistakes in that area. It's not like she or I am perfect, but I'd say, I'm going to say my wife and shout out Rachel. She's amazing. Um, and then uh, I think what we were talking about, I really believe that <clears throat> nobody wants, I, I, it'll take me 30 seconds to explain this, but I think it'll be valuable. I was trying to explain this to the, the training I was doing this week. Nobody wants money. Like ultimately nobody wants, you know, paper with dead presidents on them. Like ultimately we are in this short-term rental game uh, f- for, for a deeper reason than that. And most of the time it has something to do when I've dug deeper, I call it the four levels of why going really deep. If I say, well, why do you want the cash flow? Why do you want the passive? They say something like freedom or live my purpose or whatever. And what I try to teach people too is great. Start doing that now, <laughs> like live your deeper yeah. purpose now. Cause it'll fuel you. And then how successful you guys are just becomes a game, right? Like I'm doing it because it's a game. I'm not doing it because my life depends on it. And I, and I, and I think that's truly, and that's not something I'm perfect in, but in the last year and Emmanuel, this is why I was vibing with so much stuff you were saying, man, is like in the last year, I feel like I have, I used to be like, you, you, this is the direction I have to go. And now it's just like, no, like life is coming to me and it's way more flow. And, and I feel like I'm living my purpose so that even if this deal doesn't come through, it's cool. We're playing the game. We're playing the game. Mm. Mm. I love that, Sam. And that's such a great way to like end the show. Because again, like look at it as a game, right? Like especially like when you're going into it, like this is like if you're saying to yourself, this is my year, right? This is when I'm going to make it happen. We, I have no doubt about that. But like by you squeezing it, it doesn't make it any faster, right? By you having no leniency with yourself and like learning something new, it doesn't make any difference, right? And again, like I love analogies, right? So like, and again, since Sam is here with the with the whole martial arts thing, yeah. what have you ever seen about a person that goes into martial arts with like anger or like mm. rushness? You just get whacked, yeah, by somebody that's a lot calmer and a lot more in flow, and yeah, it sure. just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't. There is no rush, like it will happen when it happens, and just. You got to be present to that because again, like the time passes the same way. And so if you're like this the entire time, it's just, it, the journey is just not going to be as nice, <laughs> really. Like it's literally as easy as that, right? Like it just, if you hold on, you maybe get there anyways, but it's just like, wow, man. Like it just, you know, beautiful. was it worth it? Thank you, my brother. I'm so grateful you came on. Yeah. Um, Really, really appreciate it. So proud of you guys. I also love that that you and Rachel do it together. Me and Tasha do it together. Yeah, it's cool. Mike does it also with his wife. So I don't know if our wives are all just like saints, which they probably are, because I don't think I want to work with any of us. But at the same time, we're we're again we're grateful and and hopefully they don't realize um and leave us because my business will be in shambles. <laughs> um, but <laughs> other than that, thank you so much, brother. I look forward to seeing you to one of the events soon. Hopefully, yeah, man. Love you guys. Awesome. Appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Talk soon. Hey, STR Nation. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. 
And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.